Good morning and welcome. I'm Daphne Richards, Travis County Horticulture Agent with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Thank you for joining us on this webinar and our Drought to Deluge Gardening Series. We have a great program lined up for you today, Home Fruit Production. As part of this program, our presenter may refer to various source material or websites. Don't panic if you don't catch those in time to write them down. All registrants will receive a follow-up email chock full of great stuff, including a link to the recorded session and links to any references or resources listed. Today, we'll be holding our questions until the end of the program, but if you have questions along the way, you can type them in at any point. Please use the Q&A feature and we'll get to as many as time allows. Our presenter today is Dr. Larry Stein, Professor, Extension Specialist, and Associate Department Head for Extension Horticulture at Texas A&M University. Dr. Stein's focus areas are fruit and vegetable crops, and so he serves as a resource for commodity producers of just about anything edible across the entire state of Texas. I've known Larry since I started my extension career in 2000, and so I've seen him speak many times. I always learn something new. His depth of knowledge is truly broad, so because we only have two hours with him today, We've asked him to focus on the key points that are critical for anyone wanting to grow fruit in their central Texas home landscape. And so without further ado, here's my friend, Larry. Thank you, Daphne. Appreciate that very much. And so yes, today we're going to talk about growing fruit in the home landscape. So I'm, I don't know what's going on here. I apologize. I'm getting advanced sharing options. Who can share? So Larry, when you click the green button, the green share screen. Okay, now it's working, I think. Okay. I apologize. Guys. No worries. No worries. Okay, okay, okay. All right, sorry about that. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Daphne. Uh, great to be with y'all today. We're gonna talk about fruit gardening in the landscape. And so I've talked about a whole lot of general stuff and then we'll try to answer some specific questions as well. In this picture here, you see a tremendous number of fruit. You have blueberries, you have plums, blackberries, grapes. So really, when you look at the state of Texas, when you look at central Texas, it depends on how hard you wanna work. If you guys wanna grow pineapple, indeed you can grow pineapple. Now it can be challenging. Most of us can grow a nice plant, but getting them, getting them to fruit can be a challenge. What I tell people oftentimes is it takes about 18 months for pineapple plants to fruit. And so if you wanna do this and you have a plant, it's not making a fruit. If you will peel an apple and take the apple peel and put it in the whirl, that apple peel will release ethylene gas and it will stimulate this plant to produce a pineapple. So. Like I said, we're not gonna talk about pineapple today, but the emphasis of that is to suggest to you that you can grow anything you wanna do, just depends on how hard you wanna work. The big thing in central Texas is space. So we're gonna talk about space first, but realize if you try to grow pecans, they're big trees. And over time, they're gonna to get to be big trees. And so that can be a challenge. 
Like in this landscape here, you see we have grapes, you have pecans over here, or apple trees. So in 10 years, these guys are gonna shade these guys out. So remember, if you have good soil, pecans can get to be extremely large trees. So space is one consideration. Next consideration is soil. Now you guys in Central Texas know that you either have it or you don't. A lot of you guys have rock, thin, shallow soil, and that can be a challenge. But what we wanna do is we wanna work with what we have. Few of us can afford to dig it out, haul it off and bring in new stuff. And so we wanna talk about what we can do if we're not able to do this particular deal right here. So what we tell you to do is, the first thing you need to do is you need to dig a post hole in your backyard, in your garden, wherever you're gonna to try to plant these trees. And we would like for you to dig three feet. Well, as many of you guys well know, most of you may not only have six to 12 inches of soil. So do you dig through the rock down to get to three feet? No, absolutely not. You dig down as deep as you can, and that gives you a good idea what the depth of your soil. If you can go three feet, we want you to pour in five to seven gallons of water, and we wanna see how fast that hole drains. We want that particular hole. So here's the hole that we dug, we poured in the water, and you see the water in the bottom of the hole. So this is after, 12 hours, we still have water in the hole. We come back in 48 hours and we still have water in the hole. And so what we're gonna have is we're gonna have a challenge here. And so we're gonna have to mitigate the situation in order to try to grow fruit crops on that particular site. So I've worked with a lot of commercial people on iffy sites, I would call them. Like this is a Houston black clay, a very tight, heavy soil. And y'all, some of y'all sit right on the edge of the black lands. And so you well know that particular type of soil. And so this guy, in order to grow commercial peaches, he had to build raised beds. So he took a maintainer and he threw the soil up here and threw the soil up here, and then he sloped it so that the water would drain off the bed down here and then drain out. And when he did that particular situation, he was able to plant on top of the berms and grow fruit trees on a site that we would say would be less than ideal. So in a home situation, we're gonna do something like this where we build a raised bed. We're looking for about a 10 by 10. We would like to ideally have a foot to 18 inches of soil for most of our crops that we're trying to grow. And so typically we'll use a raised bed to make that happen. Remember the best soil to put in this raised bed is the same soil that's over here. If you ever take a soil physics class, soil physics dictates that water moves through one soil type first, totally until it moves into the next soil type. So having the same type of soil here would be the most ideal situation. So typically we're building up about 12 to 18 inches. Like I said, we're looking for a root zone of about two feet, pecans, we would like at least three feet, but that would, that would be the minimum that we would try to do. So we've talked about two things. We've talked about space. We've talked about depth of soil, also how hard it is and how well it drains. Now, remember, there's a, there's, everything's online now. Anything you ever wanted to know about anything is online. That doesn't make it right, but indeed that information's there. I would encourage you also to investigate a, a website called NRCS. NRCS has a web soil survey. And so you can pull up your guard, garden, your yard, whatever on that web soil survey, and you can find out everything you ever wanted to know about that soil. So use that as a resource too. I think it's a good one. So the other thing we wanna know about the soil is a little bit about the nutrient content. Here you're looking at apple leaves. These are apple leaves the way they're supposed to look. And obviously these apple leaves here have a problem. So when you see a plant with intervenal chlorosis where the leaf turns yellow and the veins stay green, that means this plant cannot take up iron from the soil. And typically that's caused by high pH. And when you have high pH, you have calcium and the calcium binds with the iron, and hence it's not available to the plant. 
And so what you need to do is you need to remember this scale. This is the pH scale. And so soil pH has an effect on the availability of the nutrients. And so the most ideal soil pH would be about six and a half to seven, which is right here. It's called neutral. And look at the width of the ribbon of these different nutrients. So you have nitrogen, phosphorus, and down the line. And so the wider the ribbon at a specific pH, the more available that nutrient to the plant. And so if we could all have six and a half and to seven, we really wouldn't have a problem. And so that is the challenge that most of us have to deal with. Now, you guys in Central Texas, you're going to be way over here in the 8 to 82 range. And so a lot of people worry about phosphorus, but phosphorus is very misunderstood. So that's not the one that we typically worry about. It's these guys, iron, as well as zinc. You see how zinc continues to decline as you go forward. And so we want to know where you sit on the pH scale. So we want you to do a soil test. And the soil test that you get back is only going to be as good as the sample you take. I personally like to sample from one to six and six to 12. And so I get two plastic buckets. I get a sharpshooter shovel. I dig a hole down to six inches and I slice a piece of soil off from one to six and it goes in the one to six bucket. Then I dig that same hole, that same hole down to 12 inches and I slice a piece off from six to 12 and it goes in the other bucket. And then you need several subsamples across your yard, garden, whatever. And uh, the more subsamples you do, the better results you're going to get back. So we say a minimum of 10 subsamples in each bucket. You mix the soil all up. You put about a pound in a bag and you ship it off to the lab. If you want to use the A&M lab, you can Google, uh, uh, you can Google soil testing Texas A&M and their website and the forms, you can find them right there. There's other private labs that you can be used. And so if you've never done one, I would encourage you to do that. So we've talked about space, we've talked about soil. The other thing that a lot of people forget about is the sun. So when you first plant your plants, they're bathed in full sunlight all day long. And we always forget how well they did. A lot of us in Central Texas are looking for shade. And shade's good for us and our house and our structures. But if you're trying to grow plants, you want them to be in full sun as much as possible. I work a lot with pecans. This is a typical native pecan grove. And in this picture right here, there are 42 pecan trees, 42. And if we were trying to grow pecans, all of these trees except one should be removed. So no sunlight hits the ground, the grass doesn't grow, and so you can't grow anything there. So sunlight, very, very critical. It's free, but we just got to be able to have our plants harvested. So this is September. So we're thinking about planting. A lot of people think about fall as planting. With fruit trees, we would like you to wait till the winter. We prefer to plant bare root trees, bare root trees in the wintertime. Now, if you want to plant in the fall, obviously you would use container trees and you can do that. Uh, but like I said, we still prefer, and when I say we, I'm talking about Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. So these particular trees, these are bare root trees, they're healed in in soil. So that means when we get a freeze in January, December, whatever, and these trees are, the temperature dropped to say 22 degrees, well, then these roots will be protected by the soil. If they're sitting on a parking lot with a little sphagnum moss around the roots and it gets to 22 degrees, I can assure you the root system's gonna freeze and those trees will never grow off like they should. And so you'll have a situation like this right here where you plant a tree and next spring it leaves out. You see how it's leaked out a little bit right here? And then those leaves wither and die and drop off. And a lot of people think, my gosh, I, I did something wrong. But nine times out of 10, there was a problem with the tree before you got it. And so when you buy these berry trees, you wanna be sure and check them out. 
Make sure that the roots don't have brown streaks in them. If they do, take them back and get you another tree. The other thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna plant 10 trees, nine of them are gonna do good, and you're gonna have one like this right here. And realize that all of these fruit trees are, are typically seed propagated. If you grow pecans, if you grow peaches, if you grow pears, all those rootstocks come from seed. And so what you have is you have a rootstock effect here. This pecan right here, it's a genetic dwarf. The root system is. And so that's why this tree is like it is right here. And so what I'm here to tell you is if you plant 10 trees and nine of them do good and one stays very small and you know that the soil and your management is all the same, then you got the tree down and you bring, it, get, bring in a new tree. Don't continue to baby these trees because they're gonna be like that forever. You can plant container trees. A lot of people like container trees because the entire root system is contained in the container. And so theoretically you could plant them this fall. I would encourage you to wait till next winter, this coming winter to plant them so that you can examine the root system. So here is a container tree and you see how the roots are circling the container. And if you have this, you need to cut these roots. And so if you plant in the next month or two, you wouldn't wanna do that. But if you don't cut these roots, they will circle forever and they can indeed eventually girdle the tree. So we like to plant in the winter time. Here's another tree. You see, we have active root growth. Obviously you wouldn't wanna plant that tree. And so we think winter is the best time to plant fruit trees, even if you plant container trees. The other way that you can establish fruit trees, obviously, is with uh, bald and burlap trees where these trees are actually dug. And so they're bald and burlap and you get instant tree. We don't recommend this at all because most people will not take enough out of the top of the tree. You need to take a third to a half of the tree out of there. And so when you spend $150 an inch to buy a tree like that, most people are not gonna take enough out of the top. So we would suggest that this would not be the ideal way to establish trees. When you plant trees, all you need is a shovel to dig the hole. We don't need a massive hole. A lot of people, when they have poor soil, they wanna dig a, dig a great big hole and amend it with compost, organic matter, et cetera. We don't recommend that. If you're gonna plant this tree in a sorry soil that has nothing but rocks and caliche, it has to learn to live there. Obviously trees don't learn, but it has to get adjusted to living in that poor soil. And so that's what you need to do. Put it in the site that you choose, even though a lot of times that may be very challenging to the tree. You wanna check out these trees before you plant them. Here's a tree that we bought at the nursery. We bought this tree at the nursery. And you see this spot of gum right here? So if you take out your pocket knife and you cut that gum away, you're gonna find a little white worm there. And that little white worm is a peach tree borer. And the goal in life of that peach tree borer is to girdle this tree. Now this tree was budded right here. In other words, this is rootstock. This is the improved variety. So when that borer girdles the tree, you've essentially killed the top. The tree will probably survive from the rootstock. And so in three to five years, you're, you're gonna come in, you're gonna go see Daphne and her master gardeners and you're gonna ask them, hey, what's wrong, what's wrong? Uh, these fruit are very small, they never get ripe. Well, you just have a rootstock. So this is a real common occurrence. And so when you buy trees, be sure to check them out before you put them in the ground. Here's another tree that we bought in the nursery. This is crown gall on a pecan tree. So if you plant that, that's forever. So go ahead and take it back, get you another tree. Most nurseries today do not grow what they sell. In other words, they have a supplier for these trees. And so they need to know if they have a problem with the, their trees so they can contact their supplier and make it right. Now, when you plant bare root trees, 
You want to have as much root system as possible. Realize roots are stored food. When you put a tree in the ground, the roots don't just magically start to grow. They have to initiate new roots. And it's easier for the tree to initiate new roots from a clean surface. And so we encourage you to leave as much root as you can, but cut off a quarter of an inch or so of the major roots. And then the broken roots, cut them off as well right here where it's broke. And so examine those roots, cut just a little bit off. You want to plant them in early January if you can. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get new roots to grow. You see these new root tips right here? Those are new roots that this tree has formed. And so by planting early in, in the wintertime, the tree will initiate these new roots. And those are where the tree will take up nutrients, water, et cetera. And so that's what we want to have farm before the tree starts growth in the spring. So a while ago, I was telling you to check out the root system before you plant it. Here is the top of a tree. This tree right here, it was a 16 foot nursery tree. The temperature went from 85 degrees one day to 15 degrees the next. And so it killed back this tissue. This is the living cells right here. So you have the inner, you have the inner wood, which you make furniture out of. You have the outer part, which is the bark. And in, the, in between the bark and the wood, you have the living cells. And the living cells should be green or white. And when the living cells are brown, you have a problem. So when you cut on a root, you don't want to see these brown streaks in there. When you cut on the top, you don't want to see that. Now, in this particular case, this tree was 16 foot tall. We could come back to four foot, cut it off, and we were at green tissue. And so this is what we're talking about, though, about the green streaks that we find in either the top or the root system. When you plant the tree, you set it at the same depth it grew in the nursery. There's a change in color there where the bark starts and the root system forms, and that needs to be right at, right at the ground line. You put the same soil you took out of the hole, back in the hole. We had no amendments, no fertilizer, no organic matter, no compost, no nothing. All we put in the hole is the same soil we watered in, and once we get the tree to grow, then we will come back and fertilize it. Now, I'm not a big fan of root stimulator. Some people use it and realize root stimulator typically is a dilute fertilizer solution. It's not a magic product. If you have a weak tree, this doesn't help a weak tree. So if you need to have a strong tree, and typically it's going to grow off and do well. This really just makes you feel good. I really don't think it does a whole lot of good. So we prefer to get them growing and then we'll come back and fertilize later. All right, <clears throat> so when you plant the tree, it, it's wet, your soil is wet, maybe you watered the soil, maybe it rained. Regardless, when you plant the tree, you have to water it in. Too many people have planted a tree, soil's wet, and, and the soil doesn't move around the root system. And so it's the water that makes that happen. So please, please, please plant the tree, put the soil, water it in, soil settles, you refill the soil, you water it in, and then you're good to go for about four to six weeks. A lot of people overwater them after they plant them, but you got to be sure to water it when you first plant it. Last thing we do is we like to cut trees back hard. We recommend berry trees, so when we plant them, we just want to plant a stick. Uh, fruit trees, we recommend you cut them back to 18 to 24 inches, remove, remove all side branches, and all you're going to plant basically is a stick. And so the three to four foot size trees are much better than the eight to 10 foot trees. And uh, if I could get you to only do one thing after this presentation, and you would cut your trees back hard, I think you would find great success in the trees that you plant. Said another way, we say you buy a $30 tree, $15 should be laying on the ground. And it's really hard to get people to do that, but I can assure you it will really, really help 
those trees get off to a good start if you will indeed do that. All right, before you buy trees, you need to know a little bit about the chilling requirements. So we live in a big state. We have chilling requirements all the way from 200, 200 chill hours all the way to 1,000 hours up in the panhandle. And so the big question everybody has is what is chilling? What are we talking about when we talk about chill? Well, fruit trees are fixing to go dormant right now in the fall based on decreasing day length and we hope decreasing temperatures. You know, the days get shorter and we hope the temperatures start to get cooler. It's been a fairly warm September, but usually towards the end, it starts to cool off. And so when that happens, your major fruit trees, peaches, plums, apricots, apples, pears, they produce abscisic acid. They produce abscisic acid. And the abbreviation for abscisic acid is ABA. And abscisic acid or ABA is a growth inhibitor. When the plant produces this growth inhibitor, that tells the plant it's time to stop growing. Uh, winter's coming. We need to store up carbohydrates for the winter. And so that's what's happening when that occurs. And so then we need a chilling, chilling time, <clears throat> chilling time to break down this abscisic acid and form a growth promoter called gibberellic acid. And so after the first freeze, after the first freeze, when the temperature drops below 32 degrees, drops below 45 degrees and not below 32 degrees, and stays there for one hour, you get one hour of chill. And so every year in, in the part of the world that you guys live in, you're gonna get about four to 600 of those hours. And it depends if you're inside city limits, if you're outside in the county, uh, the concrete island in Travis County can be tremendous. It can have a great effect. And so you need to be aware of that. If you're inside, you know, the range is about four to 500 hours is what I would suggest. If you get out the heat island, well, you may go up to 600 hours. And so that's what we're looking at, the varieties that you select. The list that's been de developed for Travis County uh, that y'all will get a copy of or have a link to has been created based on that parameter. Now, the best chill takes place between 32 and 45, and also when it's cloudy, damp, and drizzly. Best chill is on a cloudy, damp, foggy day. Stays there all day. You know, if it drops to 45 degrees and it's bright sun, you get some chill, but not a whole lot. So we like it to be cloudy, damp, dreary, just real miserable weather. And that's when you get your best chill. So if you have plants that struggle to leaf out in the spring, <clears throat> you have plants that have a certain chilling requirement come out early. So like this zone right here is about a 500 hour zone, maybe 600 hours, very typical to what you guys have. This is a 450 hour variety. You see how it's bloomed and leafed out. This variety down here is a 650 hour variety, 750, I'm sorry. And it's just starting to bloom. And this variety up here is 850 and it hadn't even thought about blooming. And so if you don't stay within that chill zone, you indeed can have effect and it will have effect on the trees and their livability. So that chill zone is very important and you can have trees that will not, not come out and it's simply based because they did not get enough cold weather. So we've talked about a lot of things. I told you we needed space. I told you we needed a soil that drains well. We also need to know the nutrient content. We need to plant in full sun. We need to select the right variety with the right chill. And when we do that, those trees are gonna, should grow. They should take off and do well. And so what we want you to do now is we want you to make them grow fast. We want you to have peaches in two to three years. And that is indeed possible if you can make these trees grow fast. This is a gentleman that I worked with up on the Red River. Big man, six foot six. These trees are on it, going into their fourth growing season. So that means he made them grow really, really fast. 
Now he has an unfair advantage over most of us. This soil is like 23 feet deep. So he has deep, well-drained soil. So in, in a situation like that, usually these trees will grow in spite of what you do. You can almost do everything wrong and the trees would still grow. With us in central Texas, where we have thin, shallow soil and maybe lacking a little bit of water or whatever, these are the big things that we have to do. We have to control the weeds and grass, we have to fertilize, and we have to water. It's not rocket science when we get all that other stuff right that we talked about, the drainage, et cetera. And if we do these three things, we can make these trees grow really fast. And this, it applies to all your landscape plants. I mean, if you're planting a tree for shade, obviously you want it to grow fast. So no weeds and grass around it. Now, some people cheat in a landscape. They don't like uh, the bare soil. They don't like the bare soil like this right here. And so they'll come in and plant flowers, pansies, petunias, whatever. And <laughs> I cut them fuss at them. I say, hey, if you want to grow these trees, let's keep that away for at least five years, five years, and these trees will grow a lot better if indeed we'll do that. So remember about weeds, weeds have roots. So we encourage you to kill the weeds before you plant. Like this is Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass has a leaf, at least a three foot root system. And so we encourage you to kill this out with say something like glyphosate. Some of y'all don't wanna use glyphosate. No worries, doesn't matter to the plant. Glyphosate breaks down to nitrogenous compounds. And so we recommend you do that and then become organic if you wanna do that because it will indeed be systemic and kill out this Bermuda grass. So realize when you kill it out, you leave all those dead roots that go down at least three feet. And so when those roots rot, you have nice pores for water to go down, oxygen to go down, nutrients, et cetera. So it doesn't matter how you control these weeds and grass. If you want to use weed berry, if you want to use mulch, doesn't matter. If you want to come out here and hoe it out, doesn't matter. Just no weeds and grass for the first three to five years. Now, these nurseries, they know what they're doing when they go in the nursery business. The big thing is they put these tags on these trees. And so you see that in winter when you've been cooped up in the house all winter. And so you see these nice big peaches and you bring that tree home and you stick it in a grass patch and you expect it to live. And so even though that's a spur of the moment planting, if we will kill out this weeds and grass, this tree, if the soil drains, will indeed grow. So weeds and grass are our biggest nemesis the first year, first, second, third year. Once the tree gets older, it can compete, but I would really encourage you to keep it away. I even work with commercial guys here. This is a commercial orchard. He planted it in with a vegetative Bermuda grass, and you can see what's getting all the water and nutrients. He even put a, a PVC pipe around it to, you know, so you could spray up to the tree, but he just never went out there and got the job done. So we control Number one thing that you do when you plant weeds, we want to keep it clean for at least the first five years out to the drip line. And if you will do that, those trees will do better than if you do nothing at all. So I would really encourage you to have a weed control plan in mind when you go ahead and plant these things. I would also encourage you not to plant too many trees so that indeed you can keep the weeds and grass away. So if you do keep the weeds and grass away, the trees are gonna grow. This is May, this is gonna be May of 2022. So you're gonna plant this tree in January of 2022, this coming winter. This is May of 2022, we have eight to 10 inches of growth. And we wanna give this, this tree one cup of, we typically recommend ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate, it's a synthetic fertilizer. It's readily soluble. You sprinkle it 18 to 24 inches around the trunk of the tree you watered in, into the soil. And within seven to 10 to 14 days, that fertilizer has moved into the tree. It's affecting the growth of the tree. Now I realize some of you guys wanna be organic and 
please understand, I have no problem with that. If you want to do organic, no problem. The tree is going to respond to organic fertilizer just the way it does to synthetic. Does it make a difference to the tree? The big challenge we have with organic fertilizers is they're very low in nitrogen typically. <coughs> a typical number is like a three here, a three. So if it only has 3% nitrogen, we're going to have use we're going to have to use seven, seven cups to get one cup of 21. So we would put out seven cups of a 3% organic fertilizer. Remember not to put it by the trunk, put it 24 inches away. And remember, it's going to take four to six weeks for the microbes in the soil to break that product down, release the nutrients to the soil, so indeed the tree can take it up. So the challenge you have with organic fertilizers is it takes time for that to happen. And so you need to know that going in if you're gonna go that avenue. You have to give the microbes time to break it down. So indeed they can become available to the tree. We don't wanna put the fertilizer too close. Now I'm gonna tell you something that's gonna sound kind of dumb, but I want you to think about it. Water moves from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Typically, the water concentration is higher outside the tree than it is inside the tree. And so the water is going to move into the root and into the tree. When you put all this fertilizer here, that's a tremendous load of salt. And you've now reversed it. The water concentration outside the tree is lower than it is inside the tree, and the water is gonna go the opposite way. That's why we told you not to put fertilizer in the planting hole. That's why we told you not to put the organic matter, the compost in there, because it's gonna be the same thing, create the same type of situation. So here's a situation where this guy had a tree over here. Uh, he had a wheat inner crop, and you can see how the wheat is browning meaning the water is moving from the wheat to the soil to neutralize that salt. So too much, too close can create a bad situation. So we want to be careful that we don't create that. So in 2023, we're going to fertilize this tree four times. 2022, the year we plant it, just once. 2023, four times, March, April, May, and June. So we put it on in March. Tree grows, come back in April, still growing. Come back in May, growth's about the same. You probably want to leave May off. And then in June, if it continues to grow, then we give it another cup. No fertilizer after June because we need the tree to slow down growth in case we get an early freeze. It's not uncommon to have a killing freeze around Halloween in Central Texas. And so that's something that we want to be aware of. So we only fertilize a tree as long as it continues to grow. 2024, we're going to do two cups, four times, two cups, four times. Same scenario. The tree continues to grow. We continue to fertilize. Or fertilize. And then once the tree is four years and older, we use one pound per inch of trunk diameter. And uh, we like to split that into two applications. We do half at bud break. The other half we put on in May if the tree has a crop. We don't have a crop in May, we leave the second half off. So we push the trees early, then we want them to slow down and make fruit. Slow down and make fruit. Here's a mature tree, mature tree. And so we wanna put that at a drip line. Drip line and out is where the root system is. And so again, half in May, half at bud break, the other half in May, if you have a crop. The other challenge that we're gonna have in Central Texas, like I alluded to a while ago, was iron and zinc issues, iron and zinc. So this is a grapevine here. It's exhibiting both of those problems. And so the best way to overcome this problem on a grapevine would be with a rootstock. They make rootstocks that overcome that. So here you see a vine that's growing on a rootstock in a high pH soil and one that is not. And so if, you're gonna grow a significant number of grapes, then obviously a rootstock would be in order. And, <coughs> excuse me, apologize for that. 
a couple of rootstocks that would work would be 5BB, another would be SO4. And so you would probably have to get these out of California. So indeed, extension horticulturists can help you run that gamut if indeed you wanna plant on a specific rootstock. With other crops, we are not as lucky. We don't have a really, really good excluding rootstock that will take up the iron and zinc for some of these other crops. And so typically we have to recommend a chelated iron. This is one of these chelated irons. It's called Ferro Plus. Now, what you wanna look for is the name on this label is, is right here. And it's a word that's about that long. But what you look for the, is the abbreviation of this iron chelate. And you can actually Google E-D-D-H-A, all capital letters. If you Google that iron chelate, indeed sources of the chelate will come up where you can get it. It is expensive, but usually we just have to use one tablespoon per inch of trunk diameter one time a year. Now, if you have a really bad situation, you might have to do two applications the first year, but once you get the tree growing, uh, you might can get by with one. You can also use a foliar spray of coppers, which is iron sulfate. Realize that if you spray sidewalks or the house or whatever with it, it will stain it. So you have to be really careful with a foliar sp spray of this particular product. Now, when we use a chelate, when you use a chelate, this chelate, you want to put it on the soil and water it in. Now, there's other chelates besides this one. Those chelates will not work as well if your soil pH is high. So this is the one that you need to get. This one here, we would never use as a foliar spray. There are some people that get the other chelate and they will use it as a foliar spray. But chelates are designed to be put on the soil for the roots to take up the product. Typically, we see zinc deficiency on pecan. So if you plant improved pecan trees, you're going to have to spray foliar zinc. Well, there's two zinc sprays out there. There's zinc nitrate, which is a liquid, zinc sulfate, which is a powder. Uh, zinc sulfate is commonly available. And uh, this is what zinc efficiency looks like. Typically, when we want to start at butt break and spray every two weeks or so for about four to six applications. And usually, you just see that on pecans, improved pecans. Now, when you do all these things that we've talked about, control the weeds and grass, fertilize the trees, these trees are gonna try to grow fast. So the bark's gonna be coming off the trees and people are gonna be asking you, hey, the bark's coming off. Well, realize the only way this tree can expand is for the bark to slough off. So in this set case, this is not a problem. This is good. We only get concerned when we have this situation where you have the wood, the wood exposed. So this is the bark, this is the wood. We typically call this sun's gall. And this side of the tree, southwest side of the tree typically heats up in the winter time. And it can go from say 85 one day to 22 the next morning. And a lot of times it can kill this tissue out. So this is a, of concern, but when the bark is just sloughing off for the tree to grow, not a big deal. So we control the weeds and grass, we fertilize. The only way fertilizer works is with water. So if you don't water fertilizer in, you just well leave it in the bag. So if you plant a pecan tree, obviously it has a long tap root, at least two feet. Uh, you can cut it off at one foot. We would prefer three feet. And so early on, that's where you water the tree. But as the tree grows, what you need to remember is the root system is growing as well. So a lot of people, when they plant a tree, they put an earthen, earthen berm, a soil berm around the tree. So it puts the water right here where the tree is. And so for the first year, second year, third year, very, very good system, very, very good system. But as the tree grows, the roots are out here. Realize the root system of most plants starts at the drip line. That's the canopy edge and goes out, goes out. And so that's where the water needs to be put. So I liken this to putting my thumb in a cup of water to get a drink. I mean, the trunk, you're not gonna get a whole lot of water. There's no roots there. And so I encourage you, 
when you drive around later today around Travis County, see how many people have the water hose right at the trunk of the tree. So what you have to do is you have to put this water where these trees can get. It. Here is the Texas A&M AgriLife Research and Extension Center in Uvalde. Look where we're watering our trees. <laughs> we're not too smart either, huh? You got to put the water where the tree can take it up. So here's the tops of these trees and see how they're struggling up at the top. And that's simply a function of where we're putting the water. Think about the canopy edge of the tree as a drip line. See how the water dripped off of this house, old house. It was enough to sustain this uh, San Augustine grass right here. So think about that as the canopy edge, the drip line, so to speak, of these trees. And that's where you need to put the water. Here is a grain crop. And the closer you get to the grain crop, the weaker it gets, meaning that the tree root system is out here in this field, sucking the water out. Tree root systems go out at least a time and a half the height. And so realize that the roots go way out. And so that's where we need to put our water so that the trees can get the best use of that water. Here's a really, really graphical good picture. Here's a tree line. This is a wheat crop. And look how far out those root systems go and are sucking up the water and the wheat is totally dead. And so realize in Central Texas, if you have a shallow soil, those roots have to go way out. And so you don't want to put a lot of plants together because they're gonna compete with each other, rather spread them out. So these root systems can exploit the soil and that will help you and help those plants do a lot better. So water source, does that matter? You know, some people wanna talk about a drip system, works great, you can use a hose, you can use a sprinkler, doesn't matter how you put it out. You just gotta put it where the root system can take it up, can take it out. So we've talked a long time already this morning, <clears throat> and we've only cut on these trees once. We cut them hard when we plant them. And so what you have to realize is pruning is a dwarfing process. These pecan trees right here in this picture are 30 years old, 30 years old. Now they are planted very close, so they do compete with one another. But every year these shoots right here are cut off for graft wood to propagate new trees. And so you see this situation. And so by pruning them hard, uh, we're gonna take off potential leaves and carbohydrates. And so we're gonna stunt the trees. And so we wanna go out there and prune those trees for a reason. So this is a good reason to prune these trees. Fruit trees will put on way too many flowers and too many fruit, and then the tree will overcrop. And so when we prune, we're cutting a lot of those flowers off. And so that is a good reason to prune. So we like to prune uh, stone fruit trees, that's peaches, plums, apricots, to what we call an open center. And so here's a fruit tree that we planted. It's grown a couple of years. And so now we're gonna open up the center of the tree. We could actually make some of these cuts during the growing season, but like we all do, we get busy during the growing season and we don't get it done. And so here's before and here's after, where we've opened up the tree, took some of these branches out, but we left all this one-year-old wood. And that tree can actually fruit on that particular wood. So this is a three-year-old tree. So we expect for it to have fruit this coming year, this coming year. Here is a typical pruned a stone fruit tree. It has a single trunk open center and it has one-year-old wood all over the tree. That is the way our commercial people do it. And we think if it works good enough for commercial people, then it will work good enough for you guys. And so that's a textbook prune tree if you wanted to do it. Now, most of y'all are sitting saying there, well, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna let my trees grow up. And so with pecan, we have what we call a modified central leader. And if you wanna do that, that's just fine. And if you do that with this peach tree, if you let it, if you don't take this out, the wood, is gonna go up and out. And so every year you're gonna to need to remove some of this wood so that you stimulate new growth that will fruit the next year, will fruit the next year. So pecans, we prune to a modified central leader, which is what you're looking at right there. And so pruning, I don't get bogged down into specific details. 
just realize it's important to stimulate new wood for growth the next year. So that's critical with all your stone fruits, pears, apples, things like that. We'll talk about the berry crops later on. The other thing you need to realize is all these crops you're trying to grow, there's a certain number of pests that are gonna be associated with them. You're gonna have fungus that's gonna knock some fruit off. You're gonna have insects. Realize sanitation goes a long way to reducing the amount of disease sprays you may need to make. And so you don't wanna let this stuff lay beneath the tree. You wanna rake it up, haul it off, or dig a hole, bury it, so that you don't get all these spores that will affect your crop, will affect your crop. Here is that same stuff that's decayed underneath the tree. You see the pits, you see the old flesh here, all those, those white looking things there, kind of off-white looking growths right there, those are spores. And so all of those are brown rot spores. And so if you don't get rid of that, next year when you have a crop and it's raining and hot temperatures, those spores go up, they will infect your crop. And so if you get rid of those, then you're gonna greatly reduce that. Get all the mummified fruit out of your tree right now. You know, this fall, this winter, get those out of those, out of there, because they just harbor disease. So we wanna take that out. Everybody see this guy right here? These are leaves. And you see this leaf-footed bug in there. Hence the name, leaf-footed bug in amongst leaves. You know, we all talk about leaves and mulch and all that sort of thing. And I like leaves. We like leaves during the growing season. But during the winter, we like to mulch these things up so that we don't create a habitat for these insects right here. So last year, you remember last, or this past February, you remember how cold it got? Everybody said, oh, it's gonna kill all the bugs. Well, <laughs> the bugs just go where it's warm when it gets cold. And so even though we had some cold weather, it got cold gradually. It didn't go from one extreme to the other. And so these guys had time to seek shelter. This winter, when you have leaves around your pot plants or whatever, go ahead and during the uh, kind of warm day, go ahead and wet that foliage down and see how many of these guys come out. You see him right there? He's kind of hidden, but you see how we wet this stuff? and He climbed right on out there. So anyway, we want to try to reduce that during the winter. So we reduce these insect websites. Well, overwintering sites. Now, our recommendation again, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service is the IPM approach. We don't recommend spraying just to be spraying. We want you to identify a problem and spray accordingly. So, like dormant oil, you know, we recommend dormant oil on peach, plum, apricot, apple, pear, but pecans too hard to get good covered. So, we typically don't recommend dormant oil those. But on all your other fruit trees, indeed, they should have dormant oil. You also you have insect pests. You also have varmints, possums, raccoons, squirrels. Guys, they're all coming to get their share. And so if you're planting fruit trees in Central Texas and you go... They're gonna get your share and you need to be prepared to deal with that. Uh, here's a situation where we have birds already getting the fruit before it gets ripe. This is Asian pear, so you need to be aware of that. They're gonna find the earliest ripening fruit. Only way to keep birds out is with nets. And so you need to be aware of that. These nets will work. They're nylon mesh nets. You have to put them on before the fruit gets ripe and indeed, if you can keep the net birds from getting under the nets, you will prevent the bird damage. One of the other challenges you have in Central Texas is we typically have either late spring freezes or early spring freezes, however you wanna classify it, like last February, a lot of trees in Southern part of the state had started to come out. And so those trees, when they start to come out and it starts to get cold, we get worried about, well, is it going to kill the flower? And realize on a tree like this, it probably has five to 8,000 flowers. And so we can lose 10% of that. We only need 500 for a crop. So the sheer number of bloods on these trees is one way that we get by a freeze. The other thing you need to realize, though, is that a bear 
bare wet surface, a bare clean surface, takes in more heat during the day and lets it out at night than one, that, one that's covered with weeds and grass. So that's why we encourage you to pull the mulch back underneath your mature trees during the winter time so that you allow the, the soil to take in that heat and then let it out at night, let it out at night. Realize here is, here is a situation where there's a tree right here. There was a hailstorm in this orchard. This was covered with weeds and grass. This was covered with bare soil. So you see how the bare soil, the heat's coming out already melting the ice where it's covered with weeds and grass. You don't have the heat, heat that's melting that ice right there in that particular situation. Realize you can use water. Central Texas though, obviously it would take a lot of water. Remember way back in science class, back when you were in fifth grade, you hoped you never had to remember that again. But when water goes from a liquid to a solid, it gives off heat. So if you were to put a sprinkler in the top of the tree and turn it on when the temperature got to about 34 degrees, when the temperature dropped to 30 to 32, the ice starts to freeze. And once it freezes, it gives off heat. And so as long as the water keeps freezing, temperature never dropped below 30 to 32 degrees. Big problem in this past February is we had people do it. Power went off, <laughs> water stops coming, freezes them worse than had you done nothing at all. Bottom line guys though is no magic products. There is none. Lot sold, lot sold, frost guard, frost free, don't, don't believe that. It sounds to be good, to be true, probably is. So no magic products, variety selection, site selection are gonna be your main thing, bare soil underneath. And that's the best way to combat that. Realize you have to have a seed, guys. These fruit have to have a seed. Those seed right there, that seed produces hormones. You know, you hear about people talking about hormones and different things. These fruit have to have this hormone to make them get large size. These right here don't have a viable embryo and consequently they don't produce a large fruit. Seedless grapes, any of y'all eat seedless grapes? That gibberellic acid is artificially supplied to those fruit so that they can develop larger size. So a viable seed, viable embryo is critical to that making that happen. So last slide before we take a break is how many trees do you need? How many trees do you need? How much work do you want to do? That box of peaches weighs 25 pounds, guys. One mature peach tree, if you take really, really good care of it, can produce three to four boxes. Who's good in math? Four times 25, 100 pounds. You have 10 trees. <laughs> what are you going to do with all that stuff? What are you going to do with all that stuff? So what we want you to do is we want you to start small. We want you to start small, plant a few trees, learn how to make them grow. And then once you get that figured out, then you can go ahead and expand. And so when we come back after the break, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some specific crops. All right, everyone, welcome back. Remember, we'll be posing your questions at the end. So if you have them, type them in using the Q&A feature. All right, Larry. Thank you, Daphne. All right, guys, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about some specific crops. And the first group of crops we're gonna talk about are what we call the stone fruit crops. So that includes peaches, plums, apricots. You can actually throw almonds in there, but though we don't recommend them because, well, well, they bloom too early and they also get brown rot really bad. Peaches, probably the most popular crop that people would like to grow in their backyard. We do have now some well-adapted varieties for the low chill zones. Before we kind of struggled with that, but today we have some really, really good varieties. The other crop in the stone fruits are, are nectarines. A lot of people have a misconception of a, what a nectarine is. All that a nectarine is, it's a peach without fuzz. So when you take the fuzz off a peach, you make it very susceptible to brown rot, to wind damage, those sorts of things. And so we would suggest to you, 
don't try to grow nectarines. I mean, that's just a greater challenge. Uh, buy your nectarines at the grocery store and go ahead and plant peaches if you want a, a peach type crop. Plums, though, on the other hand, make an excellent addition. Plums are well adapted. We actually have some native species in Texas that y'all guys have seen growing along the roads. And a lot of people have tried to use those as rootstocks. Remember, though, that a lot of those will root sprout if you're not careful. Now, if you want to use a plum as a rootstock, you would have to use Mexican plum to do that. Uh, Mexican plum is a single trunk tree, and uh, that, that's what we would suggest if you wanted to go that route. Apricots also in this group. Apricots are very inconsistent in Texas. Not really sure why. We're fixing to do some work on apricots, looking at a lot of different varieties to see if we can come up with a more consistent one. Uh, but, you know, if you got a lot of space and you really love apricots, yeah, you can experiment with them. Don't have a lot of space, uh, start with peaches. And then if you grow into it, maybe you can plant apricots later. Like we were talking a while ago, the biggest challenge that you guys are gonna have on your shallow thin soils is gonna be iron chlorosis. And so we recommend that you either use Lovell or Halford, H-A-L-F-O-R-D rootstock. This right here rootstock is nemagard, and it's for root not nematodes. In, shallow, in the shallow thin soils, heavier type soils that you guys have, nematodes are not a problem. And so you wanna be on these other rootstocks and that will help reduce this problem somewhat. Not gonna eliminate it, but it's sure gonna be a, a make a better tree than Nemegard would. Now, let me throw one little tidbit of information out there. I'm currently exper experimenting with some Guardian rootstock. Guardian was released for the Southeast for peach re root replant problems, peach replant problems. And so I actually have this some growing on some 8-2 soil. And with just a little bit of iron chelate, they've done exceptionally well. So I've been kind of impressed with that. Uh, mature trees, stone fruit trees, again, open center if possible. This is a situation where this mature tree, uh, this guy put all the fertilizer around the tree, uh, had a freeze, lost the crop, so it all went into the wood right here. Realize this new growth, this is all new growth from right there to right there. You're looking at six to eight feet six to eight feet. We don't want that. It takes a minimum of one hour to prune that tree to get it back to that situation where we have open center. This is when we talk open center. That's what we're looking at. Uh, that tree is actually laying on its side so you can see how the light's coming into the center. And so that's what we're talking about when we recommend an open center. And so it took one hour to get this tree back to that particular stage. Now, did we have to do that? Not necessarily, uh, but if we want to open center, indeed we do. We try not to make what we call heading cuts, and that's where you just cut a branch off in the middle, because when you do, you're going to get all these strong regrowth. So like if we wanted to take this branch off right here, we take it off back here to this major limb. This guy right here, you take it off back to the major limb. You know, I use, you know, use my hand as an example you know i'm not going to cut my arm off right here you know if i had to do it i would take it off at a joint and so think about these trees as having joints and cut back to those joints so that you don't get this regrowth remember that if you make a large cut on these trees which is over one inch in diameter these trees are going to respond with a strong vigorous shoot and this is like right after bud break, two to three weeks after bud break, all you do is you come out here with your hand and you rub that shoot off, take it off, take it off, take it off, take it off. And then you don't have to come back next year and take it off. So remember, these trees are going to compensate. And so you need to take care of that early on so that you don't have vigorous shoots to take care of later on. Now, some of you are not going to prune the trees to open center. And like I said a while ago, no big deal. Pruning wood moves up and out. Center of the tree is going to shade out. And so you will need to take about 40 to 60% of this wood off every year so that you stimulate new wood so the tree will continue to make peaches. 
Best time to prune is at bud break. When you see these trees in an active state of growth, a lot of people like to wait till bloom because you can see if a shoot has a bloom. Well, if it doesn't have a bloom, you're gonna take those off because they only fruit on one year old wood. So this is an ideal time to prune. Don't need pruning paint. The only ones we typically paint, obviously, are oak trees because of oak wilt, but also some people have had issue with apples. But as a general rule of thumb, we do not prune, uh, we don't paint pruning wounds on fruit trees. There are some double flowering varieties that you may want to plant. Maybe you just want a peach tree for an accent. Maybe it has some fruit. Or you could use that. This is one called Red Baron. We're actually looking at some new selections for doc, from Dr. Byrne at Texas A&M. And so we're looking at one to release as maybe a Texas superstar. And so this is, you just can't imagine how spectacular this is in early spring. This is Red Baron and it also makes a nice edible fruit. It's a little bit soft, but you know, homeowner situation, it would be an okay situation. A couple of varieties that will do extremely well in your part of the world. Techstar has very good cold bud hardiness. And so even if you have a freeze, it tends to come through. Uh, La Feliciana is, an, well, this is actually June Gold. June Gold is a 650, so it would need to be kind of on the outskirts. If you planted this in a heat island, it may have some chill issues. La Feliciana is a good all around variety. It's a 500, and when it's truly ripe, it's a true freestone. Now, y'all have a variety list, has a lot more varieties on that. I'm only highlighting a few, just ones that over the years have done really, really well. So anyway, we, ex we typically tell you to try the, try the tr tried and tested ones. And then if you want to experiment with a few of the others, you can go ahead and do that as well. Best plum that we think for Central Texas is one called Methylee. It's a medium size, medium size of small plum, juicy plum, purple plum, and it will pollinate itself. If you want to make red plum jam, you plant Bruce plum. And if you do that, you have to plant methylene to pollinate it. But if you just plant methylene, no big deal. Major pests that we see on stone fruit trees include scale. This is what scale insect looks like. Like this right here is one scale. And so that has a waxy coating on top and the insect is underneath. And so when you have that scale, that waxy covering over the scale, you just can't spray to kill it. So what you have to do is you have to suffocate it with oil. So when we tell you to spray a dormant oil spray, that's a petroleum type product, you mix it with water and then you have to cover everything really well. So if you spray this side of the tree and you don't spray the other side of the tree, you will not kill the scale on the other side of the tree. So this guy right here is best prevented rather than controlled. So I would encourage you to spray every year dormant oil so that you don't get this particular pest right here. This is a really, really bad situation. And so this tree is toast. Can't spray it to get rid of it. You'd have to prune it out. But in actuality, it's the entire tree. And so basically, you just take it out. This is peach tree borer. We talked about peach tree borer early on. But if you take your knife and cut the gum away, there's a borer there. And so you can have this particular problem show up on your trees. If you're spraying your trees during the growing season, typically you keep this guy out. This is what stink bugs or leaf-footed bugs do. Stink bugs or leaf-footed bugs have a proboscis or a needle for a mouth part. And so when they feed on the fruit, they kill those cells. And so then you have exudate coming from the fruit. A lot of times these fruit will drop off the tree. If they don't drop off, then they will have typically damage. And so this is the type of damage they have and that's called cat facing. So here you have a brown stink bug and here you have the damage they, that they, they can cause. So is this fruit edible? You know, indeed it is. Are you gonna buy that fruit? No, you're not gonna buy that fruit. And so that's why our commercial guys have to spray this to keep it clean. But you know, if you were growing this and you had a few stink bugs and you had this, 
you peel it off and eat it, and no big deal. So anyway, that is a challenge there. This is plum curculio. This is the white worm at the, at the seed. When you, you know you're eating a peach and you get down in the center of the peach, you get down in the pit and you look down and there's a white worm there. That's plum curculio. Funny thing is, usually it's just half the worm. You've already eaten half the worm. <laughs> it's got to taste like a peach, guys. It's lived on a peach its whole life. So it has to taste like a peach. But anyway, luckily, most people in Texas don't have this. But if you ever grew peaches and you had a white worm around, around the seed when you ate the fruit or consumed the fruit, then you have plum coolio. And you would have to spray if you wanted to keep it out. You would have to spray every seven to 10 days to keep this guy out. So a bad, bad problem. And commercially, we hope not to have that. Grasshopper damage. This is what grass, grasshoppers do. They start with the peeling, eat the flesh. And a lot of times I've seen just the pit. So in really dry years, grasshoppers can be a big issue. But this is what bacterial leaf spot looks like on the leaves. Uh, you get this on uh, nectarines typically. And so that's why we typically don't grow them. Realize bacterial leaf spot, it's not a round hole. It's oblong, it's, it's irregular, the, the damaged areas. This is what brown rot looks like on nectarines. Remember those spores a while ago on the ground. This is what it looks like when we're looking at the entire fruit. So these two have the spores. You reckon these two have the spores as well? So indeed, if you had these two fruit and you picked them and you didn't wash them and consume them immediately, you can mix up a bleach solution, one part bleach, nine parts water, dip these in, and that will kill any spores that are on the fruit itself. This is hail kissed fruit, hail kissed fruit. So hail storms are common in central Texas, Texas as a whole. And so this is where a hailstone hit the fruit and it didn't knock the fruit off. So realize the fruit has superized, healed over. And so I've seen commercial guys, they put up a sign, hail kissed fruit. People put in, you know, they discount the price a little, little bit. They load them up, take them home. So, you know, if that's your fruit, you peel that away and consume it, no problem. The other, the, one of the things that we encourage you to do is thin the crop. You remember we showed you the broke down tree? So we don't want you to have broke down trees because when you have broke down trees, you stress the tree and bacterial canker comes in. And so we want you to thin the fruit. We would like to have one peach for every 15 inches of uh, shoot that you have. You know, we used to use our hands six to eight inches apart. But look at this shoot right here. That's two, four, six, eight, nine fruit on that one shoot. That's nine fruit on that one shoot. And those fruit are about yay big, the softball size, not the little softball, big softball. Well, this is about a six to eight foot tree, about uh, eight to 10 foot tall. And these are the only nine fruit on the entire tree. So that's why they got so big. So take home message here is you need to reduce numbers. Don't necessarily need to spread them out. We think that's better, but the key is you got to reduce numbers so that you get larger size and don't break the tree down. Most stone fruit trees live about 15 years and then they die. This tree right here is 30 years old, 30 years old. You see how tall it is. Big keys, three big keys is, one, you never stress the tree from overcropping. The other thing is you fertilize every year. And the only way this works is with water. So fruit trees can live longer, but you have to take care of them. You have to take care of them. All right, this is what we're talking about when we talk about bacterial canker. And so when you stress trees, you overcrop them, you see this gum coming from the tree. And if we took our knife and cut that, there's no white worm there. So we know it's canker. And so that comes in when you stress the tree. So the more you keep the tree out of stress, the less likely you are to see that particular issue. Cotton root rot is a major issue that affects a lot of fruit plants. Apples and grapes are typically the worst. If you've ever had a plant that was green one day, the leaves were green one day, leaves were yellow the next day, 
The next day, the leaves were brown and stuck to the tree, did not drop. We're 99.9% .9 sure that cotton root rot killed this particular tree. To date, we have no good control for cotton root rot. It has nothing to do with cotton. You know, but you got to remember that Texas used to have cotton everywhere. Texas was the land of cotton. And when you rode down the road, you saw all these plants that died from cotton root rot. And it's real common in these fields to have circular areas. So where, where the plants died from cotton root rot. So guess what? Today, this is a subdivision and your backyard is right here and you plant a tree right here your tree's gonna die. Your neighbor over here, his backyard's over here. Tree may never die to cotton root rot. So that's the big challenge we have with this particular fungus. So if you had a plant die rapidly like that, that's what killed it, no good control. So you would have to plant, a to have to plant something that's tolerant, something like a pomegranate. We think blackberries have tolerance as well. And so that's what you would have to do in that particular issue. Now, a crop that's grossly overlooked in the state of Texas are pears. There are pear trees that are in Texas, even in central Texas, that are over 200 years old. And so the key when you plant pears is, hopefully you don't have cotton root rot, cotton root rot will kill them, but that you select the right variety. Big challenge with pears is fire blight. Fire blight will kill them. And that's a, uh, it's a mycoplasm bacterial type problem that's spread by bees. And so if you plant Bartlett, Bosque, Dianju, Camas, highly susceptible to fire blight. And so some of you are saying, well, why do these nurseries sell those trees? Why do they have them there? Because you want to plant them. You want to plant the good stuff. Well, I'm here to tell you, these are going to die so we don't plant them. And the two most tolerant varieties to fire blight are kefir, and the other one is orient. And so if I was going to recommend varieties, those are the two that I would plant in y'all's area. Uh, they, these are what we call, a lot of people call cooking pears. They have a lot of grit cells. When you eat them, it's crunch, crunch, crunch. I like that. I like that. Some people don't like that. So these are the two that have the most tolerance. The one that I told you that it's over 200 years old, the variety is called Garber, G-A-R-B-E-R. -E There's some of those around the state. And, and we recently had a fruit testing at our uh, extension horticultural retreat and Garber was by far the best tasting variety. So if you can find Garber, you can plant that one as well. If you want the Asian pears, Shinko does fairly well. It tends to have the most fire by like tolerance. So if you plant Shinko, obviously you got to worry about birds and you're going to have to control them or you're not going to be having any fruit. The big challenge we have with pears is they're large upright trees. They're large upright trees. And typically it can take them eight to 10 years before they ever start to bear pears. And so when you plant them, you cut them off and they grow up. And then you come back and you want to cut them off and then they're going to grow up again. And so what we figured out is we need to mimic an old tree with young trees. So notice how these limbs on this tree are starting, have come down. Well, what happens is this tree grows five, six, seven years, sets pears, and you see the pears here. The pears pull the limbs down. And so, so then the tree is going to be more prone to fruiting. And so what we need to do is we need to do this bend and tie the limbs when the little trees are young. So we give these young trees concrete pears, concrete pears. And so that pins the limbs down. They don't grow as upright. And so they're more prone to fruiting sooner. So we need to do this the first two, three, maybe four years. You gotta do it when the limbs are pliable, put it on. Here's a situation where we're tying it down. And if we will do this, we will get these trees into production sooner and they don't go as tall and upright before they start to bear pears. The typical rootstock for pear trees in Texas is Pyrus caloriana. 
So a lot of you all are familiar with flowering pears. And so those particular pears are Pyrus calorienda, aristocrat. Another one is Bradford. And so those are just flowering pears uh, that don't have a tree, a, a improved variety on top. So wow. these were at Stephenville at the Research and Extension Center, gorgeous trees. And so realize this is the rootstock for the common fruiting pear. Calorianna will develop on chlorosis. And so indeed, you're going to have to use arnkelatum on, on those trees to prevent that from happening. So pears, you know, if you're looking for a fruit crop, not a lot of pest problems, and you want to make pears, uh, uh, make fruit, I would suggest you start with pears. Then you may want to go to blackberries. Uh, blackberries, same boat, a lot of fruit, not a lot of pest problems. You will have some. Realize there are wild blackberries. We call those dewberries. They spread. So we suggest you not using those, but rather plant the improved ones because you will have larger fruit. There are thorny varieties and there are thornless varieties. The best thorny variety is one called Kiowa. Uh, if you want to plant more than one, Brazos works fairly well, as well as Roseboro. The best Thornless varieties, the best one for y'all's area is going to be Arapaho, not Apache. Apache's too high a chiller. One that we made at Texas Superstar is one called Natchez. Large fruit, large fruit. The only problem with Natchez is it will make too many blackberries. And so you're going to have to kind of prune the cane to keep them in check. If they overcrop, they tend not to come back. We're now experimenting with, with one called Ponca, which is on the market. So University of Arkansas has done a tremendous job with these thornless blackberries. And so we're really excited about the possibility. You establish blackberries from root cuttings. So you plant them just like a root, put them in a trench, cover them with soil, and the plant will emerge. They're biennial crop. They grow a top one year, it fruits the next, and then that particular top will die. And so you need to, you know, so here is the shoots that grew the year before these shoots grew in 2020. So this is 2021 when they made fruit. So once these fruit and they die, here are the canes for next year's crop. And so you take these out, leave these, prune these to a hedge. You know, some people like to take the thorny ones out. Obviously, this is a photo op. If this is thorny, you got to have long sleeves, gloves, goggles, a mask. I mean, those thorns are vicious. You really got to protect yourself when you go that. Some people like to grow them as a hedge or maybe in a container. If you had a container, you could put them in a container and you can keep them pruned back. Think about the Foundation hedge around the house, that's exactly what we're doing there with that hedge, and it will make one gallon per foot of row. And so that's a hedge that's about four foot tall, three to four foot wide. So you can make a lot of blackberries in a short amount of space. Some people like to put them on a trellis. If you want to do that, no problem. You can do that. Uh, when these canes die, though, obviously you got to prune them and take them off the trellis, take them off the trellis. Again, our chlorosis can be an issue. Thorn chelate is going to be a must. Blackberries do not get any sweeter once you pick them. So they go from green to red, to shiny purple, to dull purple. So it's somewhere in between the shiny and dull that they're most ripe. Now, some people like an acidic day. Some people like them sweeter. So you need to determine when you want to pick them when you're out taste. And when you're out here, pick them, taste them. So indeed, you figure out exactly what you like. But realize also, you need to pick them every day. And if you want to have them super sweet, you got to let them get right on the plant. They will not develop sugar once you pick them. Once you pick them. Raspberries, you really ought to put an X through here right now. Although we have exi some exciting work going on in the hill country where we're looking at different raspberry varieties. Currently, the only one you can grow in Texas is one called Dorman Red. And those of you that know what true raspberries taste like, it's not the best, but it is a raspberry. But we have some work going on where we're shading the plants with different shade covers. Uh, we're using red and white and blue and also aluminum. 
And out of all those different colors, also black, out of all those different colors, what would you think would be the coolest? And the obvious answer is white. You would think white is the coolest. I can assure you that's not the case. Actually, red is the coolest. And so we got some exciting work going on with that where we think if we shade these things, we may be able to grow raspberries in Texas. And so that would be really, really exciting because these are the really, really good raspberries. Another crop that's not planted much in Texas is uh, persimmons. Persimmons don't require a lot of care. Uh, you have astringent persimmons and non-astringent persimmons. This is, this is Eureka. It's, uh, you see how it's get going from orange to the red here, the reddish orange. And so they gotta be perfectly ripe. I personally don't like persimmons because they're too sweet. Now, if you like something really sweet, these guys will do it. These guys will do it. When we tell people to plant persimmons, a lot of them use them as an ornamental in their landscape. So Hychea is a persimmon about this big, great big persimmon. So you have this dark glossy green foliage, a large fruit. So they kind of make a show in your particular landscape. So maybe that's what you want to do. If you want to eat them, I would suggest you stick with Eureka. Again, a lot more varieties on y'all's variety list. You know, these are the ones over the years that have done the best. And so that's why we highlight those. If you want a persimmon that doesn't have to be totally ripe, just has to turn orange, obviously Fuyu, it's non-astringent. Again, though, it's more like eating an apple or something like that, as opposed to having the re really sweet, uh, juicy, flesh that we expect with the astringent persimmons. As a general rule of thumb, I suggest just plant one variety. <clears throat> if they're gonna, if you plant two, they will cross pollinate and set seed and see how it kind of browns the flesh around the seed. Now, it still tastes perfectly fine, not a problem there. It's just the aesthetic appearance. But so as a general rule, I suggest just one variety. So you have seedless fruit, but realize if you have seedless fruit and you stress the plant, the fruit are gonna drop off. So you typically have a seed in each of these corpals and that seed again, just like a while ago, produces the hormones to keep these fruit from dropping off the tree. So persimmons, we spray basically nothing. The biggest challenge you have is a little bit of cold damage. We use the common American persimmon, not that purple one, but the one that grows in East Texas as the rootstock. Figs are an interesting crop, and figs make an interesting plant for you to plant in the heat, highland, heat island areas of Travis County, you know, where you have a lot of protection from the cold. Uh, these guys can do well. They can freeze back, and so that's why we typically grow them as a bush as opposed to a tree. And so here's a garden situation where they froze back, they're coming back. They grow great as an understory plant. So here is a tree right here, hackberry tree. And notice how you get some protection under that tree. So this past February, you would have got some protection for that particular plant. And it would probably helped it survive the cold a little bit better, a little bit better. And so it's one of the few crops you can grow in a bit of light. They tend to layer on you where the, the shoots will lay down and they will root in. You see that how this plant is rooted in. And so they root readily from cuttings, dormant hardwood cuttings, or actually this plant is rooted into the ground. So you could actually dig this during the dormant season and you could plant it in a new place in your landscape. Still three major varieties today. We think Celeste has the greatest cold tolerance. So we would suggest that's probably the best one to plant. We're looking at some other varieties though, and that could change in the future. Alma, more of a Gulf Coast variety, although it has survived 14 degrees in Fredericksburg. So it is a possibility for you guys. And then you have Texas Arrow Bearing or Brown Turkey. So three main varieties do extremely well. You typically have a crop which comes out on the old wood, and then you have the new crop which comes out on the new wood. If you have nematodes, if you have nematodes on other plants, they can be a problem on figs, but in y'all's country, in your soil, 
nematode should never be a big issue. Realize it's these gall is where the nematode is, the female nematode. So the nematode feeds on the root and it causes the root to form a gall. And so when it forms a gall, then that root is less efficient at taking up water and nutrients. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about uh, nematodes. Now a crop that you wouldn't think of that you might plant in the ground in Travis County would be blueberries because blueberries have to have an exact soil pH. The pH has to be from four and a half to five. And y'all guys is, you know, seven, eight, eight, two or higher. And so to lower your soil pH to get to that stage, almost impossible. But you never tell anybody, never, because they'll always prove you, prove you wrong. So like for us, we recommend you grow them in containers if you're gonna do blueberries. And it works well in a container, acid soil, use rainwater, and they'll do quite well. But here is a situation. This was in the Texas Hill Country. This was in Kerr County. Very similar to the type of soil you guys have. You know, this guy called up and said, hey, I want to grow blueberries. I said, sure, no problem. I'm probably going to grow them in containers. And he said, no. He said, I'm going to bring in a jackhammer. I'm going to take the right rock out. I'm going to put in French drains. I'm going to bring in acid, peat moss, sphagnum moss. I'm going to put in a RO, reverse osmosis water system. I'm going to put in hail screen, and I'm going to grow blueberries. We said, fine. <laughs> what are you going to tell him? I mean, he had the money to do it. So obviously he was going to do it. And by God, he did it. He did it. Grew tremendous plants, produced tremendous amount of berries. That's what he wanted to do. So we never tell anybody never if you want to do that, but you can. But for most of us to grow, we're going to have to grow them in containers. Over time, they're going to get a bit leggy. We're going to have to take the old wood out every so often. You got to keep monitoring the soil pH. Once it gets out of whack, the plants are not going to do very well. So you've got to keep adding pine bark mulch from an acidic source. You cannot add pine bark mulch that grew in Travis County. I mean, if you have pines that grow in alkaline soil in Travis County, the mulch that comes from them will not be acidic. So the pine bark has to come from an acidic source for it to be acidic. So you gotta keep monitoring that pH, take the old ones back. And again, the pest problems are really quite minimal on blueberries because it's kind of an unknown crop, has a very fine fibrous root system, only exploits about a foot of the soil. So water, you have to almost daily water these things if you do have them in containers. You can use azalea food on them uh, in the same family. So if you want to do that, you could indeed do that. Grapes, realize there's a sizable commercial industry of grapes in Texas. You know, I don't know that you'd want to be commercial, but just remember there is. PD threatens the limit of this grape. Those of you that have been from Fredericksburg to Johnson City lately know the number of wineries along the road there. Do you guys realize that's the number two wine destination in the entire United States behind the Napa and Sonoma Valley? So it's just unreal what's happening up there in that part of the world. And so if you hadn't been up there, maybe you wanna make a trip. This is what PD does to the grape mines. It stops up the vascular system so that the leaves burn on the edges. You can't no longer translocate water. So that is the issue there. So you have to plant resistant varieties. So for you guys, Blanc de Bois, if you wanted a white grape, would work extremely well. It kind of has a fruity flavor to it. So that would be a good one for you to grow. One that we're excited about is Victoria Red. This is a joint release, Texas A&M, Texas A&M and the University of Arkansas about five years ago. And so it's on the market. And so we're fixing to release another one that's coming probably, we hope to, for it to be available in 2022. It's gonna be named Southern Sensation Seedless. It actually is a true seedless grape. 
that is resistant to PD, Pierce's disease. And so we're kind of excited about those varieties. This guy right here does really well, long cluster. Big berry has a few seeds, so you would have to realize cedar grapes typically have a better flavor than seedless yeah. grape. We've already talked about the high pH soil using a rootstock to minim minimize that. In warm, wet weather, you're gonna have black rot, so you would have to spray a fungicide, so that would be an issue there. Can have leaf folders where a worm, Worm is in between here, so BT would control that. So there are pests that we can't control. Birds, huge issue. Only way to keep them out is with nets. And I mean, mockingbirds, they're gonna get your fruit if you're not careful, so nets. Realize it's, uh, you, you prune grapes based on the number of buds. One bud produces one shoot, one to two clusters of grapes. So typically 10 buds on one side, 10 buds on the other, 20 shoots, 20, 20 buds makes 20, 10, 20 buds makes 20 shoots. That makes 40 clusters, 15 to 20 pounds of grapes. And so you prune grapes exceedingly hard and you leave those buds on either short shoots called spurs or longer shoots called canes. Here's before and uh, here is an after. So about 90% of the growth comes off. So prune grapes really, really hard in order to make them produce a good fruit. Can't give this talk without talking about pecans. Pecans are native to creeks and rivers. So that tells you that you need fairly deep soil. If you have really shallow soil, we would encourage you not to plant them. Although they will, they will grow there. They will grow there. And if you have a situation where you have a shallow soil and you want to plant a pecan tree, we would suggest you plant a seedling tree, ungrafted tree, uh, makes great shade, grows well, doesn't need a lot of care. Only unknown is the pecan. Pecan could be really small or it could be fairly large. If you want a recommended variety, that most outstanding tree for Travis County, most outstanding uh, homeowner variety is Sioux. It's a gorgeous tree, grows extremely well, doesn't take a lot of training, makes a small, very high quality pecan. And so if you just want to show tree in your landscape and you got, you know, two to three feet of soil, you can grow Sioux. If you have really, really shallow, thin short soil, you probably shouldn't plant a pecan tree, even though they will grow there. If you want another variety, a larger variety, it takes two for cross-pollination. And so if you want to be sure that you have pecans, you would want to plant, say, a desirable in a Sioux if there's not other pecan trees within a quarter mile of where you plant this particular tree. Two keys you gotta do to make pecans is, just like we said a while ago, is you gotta fertilize every year and water every year. There's a homeowner's fruit and nut spray guide uh, that you can download. When you go to pecans, it has eight to 10, 12 sprays. Guys, it's not economical to do that if you have two trees in your backyard typically. So if you just keep them healthy with water and fertilizer, Usually they'll make a crop every two to three to five years. This guy right here won the state pecan show twi twice. Won the state show twice, and this is all he ever did right here. Water's real, real important right now. Pecans are trying to finish filling, and they got to fill the kernel, got to open up. So if you got pecans and they are got a good crop on them, be sure that you water them in the next two to three weeks until we get some fall rain so that you fill out the kernel and cause them to open up. Last crop I want to touch a little bit on is citrus. And we don't think of citrus as being a, you know, a, a crop that you plant in the ground outside the valley. But uh, we do have some people doing that and realize that satsuma is very cold hardy once you get it established. But it may be that if you elect to grow satsumas or other citrus, that you have to build some kind of structure over them. So that indeed you can cover them. And so there's a lot of people willing to do that. Again, you never tell people never. You know, I've had people, oh, I'm going to grow it in a greenhouse or I'm going to do this. And so we recommend Satsuma. We think it's the best eating, <clears throat> best quality cold hardy citrus. Uh, we've actually been doing some work on some other citrus, Changsha. Changsha is a type of tangerine. 
realized Changsha will grow as far north as Dallas, not necessarily fruit there, but it can live there. And so we had Dr. Moy at the Botanical Garden. One day, Dr. Jerry Parsons told him, Dr. Moy, you ought to make a cross between Changsha, which is really seedy. You see all the seeds there. He said, you ought to make a cross between that and Satsuma. And so indeed, Dr. Moy made this cross. And this has been probably 10, 12 years ago now, maybe 15. And so one day we were working at the Botanical Garden, Dr. Parsons and I, and Dr. Moy had all these trees and they started to fruit. And when they started to fruit, each of these trees was, it was different. Now what's unique, very unique about that is, if you take this seed right here and plant it, you get the same tree. And so if you make this cross, you have to look at those embryos and only pull out the one where the cross has been made. To further complicate that, if you look in the literature, that cross had never been made, never been made. And see here this Dr. Moy uh, migrated from China and he made the cross and two of those varieties are now on the market in Texas. And so we think that they're a little bit more cold hardy. In the February freeze and the plantings that we had in the ground, indeed these plantings survived better. So the two plant, two varieties that are on the market are Arctic Frost. Well, this is Changsha again, showing you the seeding nature of the fruit. This is Satsuma. And then this is what the cross looks like. You can have one or two seed and they're still called, called seedless. So this is Arctic Frost. We think it has the greatest cold tolerance. And then the other one is Orange Frost. Those of you that have any kind of citrus, uh, when they start ripening here in a little bit, you're gonna see damage on some of those fruit. And it's these guys, boat tail grackles, they feed on them when they're very small. Uh, this is the type of damage they cause. And then when they start to get ripe, uh, then you're gonna have some type of damage on. Citrus per se, they can have leaf-footed bugs, other bugs. Typically, we don't even spray them. I've sit seen situations where they had scale, and we just kind of left them alone. But remember, talking about a tropical crop, if you elect to grow it in the ground, you're gonna have to protect it in some years. So my last slide, my last slide for today, uh, keep the planting small, keep the planting small so that you don't kill yourself and take the fun out of it. I worked with these, this couple when I was in Stephenville. Uh, they had a small orchard in Heiko, Texas, Heiko, Texas. And they started out with walnuts. And then they planted apple, and then they planted peach. And they just, it got to be a burden. And so it wasn't fun anymore. So I would really encourage it. Keep it small, plant only what you like. Don't take the fun out of it. And that way you're gonna have a greater chance of succeeding. So with that, I am gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, we'll try to answer some questions. Wow, that was fabulous information and I don't think I'm alone in feeling overwhelmed and so if you're feeling overwhelmed participants that's normal I, I think you can gather uh, from our discussion these last two hours that fruit trees are a fair amount of work so they are not for the faint of heart gardeners there's not something you want to plant a lot of as Larry finalized it's plant what you want and stay small so you can focus on it so uh, we do have a lot of questions, obviously, so let's dive right in. Uh, what is the best rootstock for persimmon? Let's start with a simple one. All right, so the best root, rootstock for persimmons is going to be the common American persimmon. It's a little orange persimmon that grows native to East Texas. When you buy a Japanese persimmon at the nursery, it's going to be grafted onto that rootstock. Okay, that's very good there. Uh, when is the best time of year to prune fruit trees like peaches? The best time hey, of be year. Stone best time. I'm sorry. <laughs> best time to prune tree, fruit trees in Texas is at bud break. Let them bloom. Let them leaf out. A lot of people do that in, in case we have a late freeze. If you leave all those blooms, then you have more to get by the freeze potentially. So time when they're blooming or bud break is the best time to prune. 
All right, uh, we have a question about painting applied to the bark. You mentioned sun skull. I made a note of that for people, especially on young trees. So talk to us about painting tree bark. Right, okay. So interesting, I'm glad you asked that question. I meant to talk about it a while ago, but so I was at this peach orchard in North Texas where he had all the trunks painted, all of them painted. I said, what are you doing this for? He said, I think it looks pretty. <laughs> so, so some people paint it because they like it. One of the things you have to remember, though, is a lot of insects are colorblind. So when you come out of the ground, they're looking for when they see white. You know, they they don't go there. But you do reflect some light, keep the temperature down, and it tends to minimize the sun scald. So young trees, that's why we do it, minimize sun scald. One part latex paint, one part water. Use uh, one of those gloves, just paint the trunk. Yes, cute for the sun. All right, are there any problems with paint planting trees in proximity to a septic tank? Two part question, the large root diameter, uh, what it, does it cause problems? Um, does it, is it attracted to the water in the septic field? And then are there any additional issues with you know a food crop planted on a septic field? All right, so the Good question. Trees planted near the septic system, you're not going to have a, a problem with the fruit crop. Fruit crop will be fine, will not be any worries there. Now, you are going to have a lot of roots that are going to get in there. And that, if you have the drain lines, it can stop some of those up. And so you, you got to be careful about that. You know, I just wouldn't plant it right on top for sure. All right. Uh, any or recommendations for fruit trees to be grown as espaliers? Oh, good question, espalier. So I like to espalier pears. I, I, in fact, I used to do that with pears, but they're so vigorous that you have to stay after it. And finally, I couldn't keep up with it. I've also done apples. So I think those two actually works really well. Now, there's another one you wouldn't think about would be blackberries. We have some people in Alabama actually prune them, you know, to a single cane and just really, really prune them and you get really, really big fruit. And so if you really, if you really want to do something, blackberries may be a good one to try as well. Wow. And those grow and are probably about our least maintenance crop as, as well. So that's good right, advice. Right, right. All right. So a gentleman has uh, purchased two fruit trees from Stonewall, has them here in Austin now for a couple of years. Great blooms this year, many fruit, but most of the fruit died, withered and dropped off, and then some never got larger than the thumb before rotting from the pit out. The tree is large and pretty help, uh, healthy, but the problem with the fruit. All right, so it's made good fruit in the past or you didn't say? I uh, didn't say. Didn't say, okay. So, I mean, that, that almost sounds like the the embryo got froze, the seed got froze last February. They may have bloomed too early or something like that is what it sounds like to me. So I would suggest give them a couple of more years and see if they don't cross pollinate and he'll probably be okay. And the other thing is he has a rootstock since they didn't get big and it's just rootstock. Yeah. And you said he brought them from Stonewall. It bought him, I guess, at a nursery in Stonewall. Well, I don't know of a nursery in Stonewall, so maybe he dug up some trees. Maybe. And so um, we're he said he did, we did have trees. a good crop a couple of years ago. So okay, okay. They, they do they do have potential to to fruit. So I think you're right about the breeze. Okay, good, 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 good. All right, let's moving right along. Uh, uh, we didn't touch on any tropicals, but did you be? And then I know we're doing some work on kiwi. So any any advice or on jujubes or a hardy kiwi? All right. So jujube, jujube. I I've, I'm stopping talking about jujube. Uh, I I tried them. You know, there's some new ones on the market that are sweet. The fruit is really really sweet. But the problem we have with jujube right now is the root sprouts. And when you plant one, you're gonna have twenty. And I mean, I I was planting some and shoots were everywhere. I said, this is crazy. So in my mind, until we get the shoot thing worked out, I don't think we need to plant 
jujubes. Now, jujubes will grow anywhere. And if you can tolerate the sprouts or you want to dig them out every year and keep up with it, go for it. Uh, Lee and Lang are still the two best that you can do. Uh, we have some people working with some other varieties, so we shall see. We shall see. The kiwi thing is going to be very limited. I think it's going to be mainly an East Texas crop. We do have some growing in College Station, but the alkaline soil is going to be a big challenge for it. You have to have cross-pollination, a male and a female. So kiwi may be very specialized. We may see some under some high tunnels for protection, but I don't think the average homeowner in the next few years is going to be able to plant them. Got it. Uh, any advice on primocane fruiting blackberries like Primark or Freedom? Good question about the prime, primocane fruiting ones. You know, they're going to fruit on the primocanes in the fall is what they're going to do. And the challenge is the heat we have in the fall. You know, if it cool down, I could see maybe. But I think what you're going to do, they're gonna, mainly going to fruit them in the spring. You may have a few fruit in the fall. But at this stage of the game, I don't think we have the variety that it's going to be consistent from year to year. And I don't think the quality is going to be exceptional just because of the heat. Because I realistically, they would be fruit on the plant right now, fixing to ripen. And it's just too darn hot, too darn hot. Yeah, for sure. Okay, what about mulch types? We talked about leaving the ground clear around the plant, so no weeds, so bare ground or mulching. And what type of mulch do you recommend? A good Doesn't question. Matter. I mean, I like the organic bark mulches. I like the double shredded stuff so it breaks down fairly well. If, if I had all the money to pick just one or whatever, I'd get pine bark mulch. I really would, just because of the acidifying effect that you would get. So I could see great things from that, but you know, I don't know that anybody could afford to do that. Right. So uh, th and there's a second part of the question, which is about pecan shell mulch. The, they used it last year and they noticed some problems this year with the, with the trees. Would, would that have been anything to do with the mulch? Was that just okay. a question? Pecan shell, pecan shell mulch. mulch. No, I don't anticipate any problems with that. There okay. are things in it, and I would use it. You know, if, I would use it in my landscape. Now, let, let me tell you why I don't use it. The reason I don't use it is I'm in a weevil free area. I don't have pecan weevils where I live. And I'm concerned that if you get pecan shell mulch, there could be some weevils after they shell. And then I would introduce weevils to a weevil-free area. So that's yeah. what it. Very, very important to, to note there. Okay. Uh, let me we did that one. Pineapple guava. Pineapple guava is not one that we talked about. It is a, a little bit different fruit. It is. And it I think it has potential. I think it has potential. We yeah. I haven't done any major work with it yet. We have a few people going to do some, but no, it's one that's not out. I think it, I think we will see more of that in the future. I think we yeah. will. They do well here uh, in, in our area. And then okay. for a while they were, being, they were being planted a lot in new landscapes. So the contractors must have gotten a big lot of them because they were planted a lot. So they do well here. So that's okay. That's cool. Good. People like the way they eat, the way they taste. Glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. Good. We're getting all of the extra uh, questions on things we didn't touch on. So yes, obviously we couldn't touch on every single fruit, but how about loquats or pawpaws? Okay, so loquats have a possibility, especially in your heat islands. They make a great tropical plant. They're all typically grown from seed. Uh, typically they start to bloom though in January. And so you can, you know how cold you can get. So Fruit production could be a challenge there. And so it's a possibility in the heat island, I would suggest. Outside it, I wouldn't think so. You could probably grow them as an annual though. I, you know, and then mulch the crown really heavily and they may come back every year if you wanted the tropical look. 
And the other one you said was pawpaw? Pawpaws. Pawpaw, yeah, yeah, yeah. So pawpaw, acidic soil would have to be East Texas steel. So I couldn't see that happening in Central Texas. Very good. And like you said, never say never and containers <laughs> and, you know, you well, you and I both have worked for extension a long time. We know as soon as you tell something, someone something won't grow here, they're going to do whatever it takes to prove us wrong. And that's OK. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's right. That's right. So we've got time for just a couple more. Uh, uh, someone bought a peach tree and planted it in the wrong spot. So it doesn't, it's not getting enough sunlight. So they want to transplant. It's been in the ground a few years. How is the best way to do that, transplant that tree? All right, to transplant that tree, you wanna wait till it goes dormant and then you wanna dig it up. You wanna get as much of the root as you can. You don't have to necessarily keep it in a ball, but if you kept it in a ball, you'd probably get greater liv livability. And I would suggest you need to take at least a half, half of the top off. You gotta cut it hard. For cut that, it extremely hard. That. Yep, yep, yep. So what you're, what happens when you prune out all the roots, you that you don't have enough roots then to either uh, feed the tree, water and nutrients, and then also to stabilize in the ground. So that's a very good point about taking out the top growth. Uh, just a couple more uh, fruit trees uh, in containers. They're about seven years old, planted in May, and uh, she does not know if the roots were healthy when she planted them. Um, but the tree, uh, uh, I don't really see the question here. I didn't know. Um, so I think the question is, uh, she didn't examine the roots when she put the tree in the ground. Is there any way now to know whether the tree was healthy or whether it would have problems with the roots when she purchased it, if it's been in the ground now several years? What would, are there any telltale signs that the roots might have been damaged when it was purchased? If it's lived seven years, I'd say that roots were fairly, fairly healthy. So right. you just know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. And, and last question, uh, a really good one that that we, you know, we don't talk about a lot because it's I don't think the answer is going to be one the person wants to hear. But are there any fruit fruiting crops, trees, whatever that can take less sun? We, you know, we started out the whole conversation with water, sun soil, these needs that fruit trees have, four to six hours of sun, is there anything that a person could grow and would fruit in only four to six hours of full sun? The, the only one that's a possibility would be fig. Fig. Some yeah. figs, some understory plants that will make a few, but production's not great. Production's not great. So they will grow there, not necessarily fruit a whole lot. All right. All right. That's all the time that we have, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll follow up individually. If you write any last minute questions in there, we didn't get to it. We'll, we'll follow up with you individually. Thank you, Dr. Stein, for a wonderful presentation. I appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with us today. And thank you to welcome. our attendees for participating. Very soon, you'll receive an extensive email from us, including a link to a short survey. And we'd really appreciate if you filled that out. Your feedback helps to ensure that Extension can continue to offer these types of valuable programs in the future. That email will also include a link to the access to this recording of today's session, a list of resources for further study, and links to any websites that were referred to today. You can also uh, contact us at our phone or our email and ask us any question you have in the future that will also be included in your email. And uh, until next time, thank you for joining us and happy gardening.